At 19, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And a number of months later, I was reading the book of Esther. The book of Esther is uh, an interesting story in the Bible about a brave Jewish girl by the name of Esther who becomes the Queen of Persia. Esther is raised by her cousin Mordecai after her parents die. King of Persia, though, uh, chooses Esther to be his new queen, not knowing that she's actually Jewish. Now, one of the king's advisors, name is Haman, hates Jewish people, and he convinces the king to make a law to kill them all. Mordecai, he finds out about this plan, asks Esther to help. Now, at first, Esther is scared to speak to the king because it could mean her own death. Mordecai at that moment uh, decides to send this message to Esther. And you'll find this in Esther chapter 4 and verses 14. And it says this. It says, Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father, father's family will perish. But who knows that you've been born for such a time as this? Now, Esther at that moment decides to be brave. She stands up for her people. She invites the king and Haman to a special dinner where she reveals that she's Jewish and explains Haman's evil plan. The king is absolutely furious about this, orders Haman to be punished because of Esther's courage. The Jewish people that day are actually saved. Now, when I came across Esther 414, I found myself meditating on that over and over, repeating it in my mind. If you Remain silent at this time. Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But who knows that you've been born for such a time as this. I have that go over and over again. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. But who knows you've come and been born for such a time as this. Well, while I'm meditating on this, I have a vision. And in this vision... I was sitting in a stadium. It was filled with thousands upon thousands of people. I was sitting away at the back, row three from the very top. They call it the nosebleed section. And uh, I was looking down from the very top. And next thing, there's a worship team, incredibly anointed worship team. Uh, Power of God came thick into that place. Next thing, there's a preacher up there. My goodness, he could preach with fire, preach with passion. I noticed that he would throw his arms like this. And I saw people when he kind of threw his arms like that, people on the end of the rows would just get thrown off the rows. I, I saw a person in that meeting that was blind, that started to see supernaturally healed people that were deaf started to hear. One of the things I noticed that there was a, a, a person in a wheelchair and as they were wheeling along uh, the, the floor, uh, they just kind of stood up. The power of God came upon them and uh, instantly healed. Well, next thing I noticed that all across this stadium, people started to weep. They started to cry. It was like conviction came into the place. And before he had even given an altar call, people started coming down the front, getting on their knees, repenting before God. It was incredible what was going on. I came out of that vision. And what happened was, is at that moment, I heard the voice of God. And the voice of God said to me, Kerry, that should have been you up there preaching. Immediately, I heard that scripture in my mind that I'd been meditating on for hours upon hours that day. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But in the meantime, you and your father's family will perish. But who knows that you've been born for such a time as this? Come on, let's just pull that apart. If I remain silent, well, number one, God is going to raise someone else up. If I don't do what God's called me to and destined me to do, he's going to find someone else to fulfill the assignment that was placed on my life to do. Remember those words, Kerry, that was meant for you on stage. And I knew that if I do not step into my calling, by the way, it's my choice. God's going to raise someone else uh, to do it. Or as the scripture says, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. And so it will be for you. There are things that God has called you and assigned you to do here on planet earth. If you remain silent and if you don't step into your calling, God's going to raise someone else up. And I believe that there are many people in the latter part of their lives, they kind of look back and uh, they look back with regret that they didn't step into the calling that God had for them. And so it's going to be for us as a church, Game Changer Church, we're called to do our part in the preaching of the gospel and taking the good news to places that don't have access to it. And if we don't do our part, if we don't step into our calling, 
God's going to call another church to do it. And I, I want to call forth the ministry potential in your life. I want to call forth the man of God inside of you. I want to call forth the woman of God inside of you. Come on, we need to step up as people, step into the calling that God, God's got for us. But the second thing is that people will perish. Now, the good news is this, is that God is gracious. And between you sitting back and someone else stepping into it, uh, the unfortunate thing is that there are going to be some people that perish. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Uh, earlier in my walk with God, I felt really compelled to share the gospel with a 16-year-old boy. Now, uh, he had been doing community service in the church I was part of. In fact, we actually had an ex-gang member that was doing some community service in our church that were working side by side. And I remember being prompted of God to share the gospel with a 16-year-old. And I thought to myself, well, look, I've got a few more days. He's got plenty of hours to fill. I don't want to hit him on the first day. Uh, just uh, give me a bit of time. Well, this gang leader, uh, he comes down to my office. He goes, man, I don't know why, but I just kind of feel like I've got to share the gospel. And I, I'm kind of new to this stuff. I'm kind of a bit of afraid to talk about this stuff. Funny that a, uh, a gangster, ex-gangster, was a bit afraid talking to a 16-year-old. But he's like, come on, man, you're the youth pastor. Uh, you need to go and uh, tell him about Jesus. And I said, look, he's going to be doing some service hours next few weeks I got some time well that day I unfortunately didn't share the gospel with him and uh, the next day when he was meant to show up he doesn't show up he doesn't show up the day after well uh, when we go to chase him down I actually find out that uh, he had a car accident he was in the back car of a car uh, his friend was drunk in the front, lost control outside of the school that he had been expelled from, hit the pole, and uh, by the time he got to the hospital, he was dead, a 16-year-old. And uh, here's the point. If I'd remained silent at this time, uh, I missed out on my opportunity to share the gospel with him. But, but here's the thing, is that uh, in the meantime, he perished. Now, I don't know what happened before he went to heaven, uh, God's incredibly gracious. Maybe he sent someone along there, but I'm telling you this, that had prompted me. Come on, I don't want to miss out on the opportunity in the future. And I want to tell you this, let's not miss out on the opportunities God's given us as a church to share the gospel uh, in this time, in this hour. So once again, God's going to raise up other churches to do the job if we don't step as a church, game changer church, we've got to step into our calling. Number three, born for such a time as this. I love this. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. But who knows that you've been born for such a time as this? Oh my goodness, I love this. We're born. Uh, not for next week, not for next month, not for next year or next decade. We're born for now. And, and I talk with people all the time and they're like, one day I want to do something great for God. One day, uh, maybe next month, maybe next year, pastor in the future out there really want to do something great for God. And it's kind of like this pushed out. It's a delay. It's an excuse. But no, no, no. You've got to understand we're born for now. Now is our time. It's time for you. It's time for I. It's time for us as a church to step up and uh, do our part. Come on, turn to the person right now and say, now. Come on, that's right. Now is the time. And uh, you know what? Uh, I've, I've driven past grave sites all the time. I'm sure you've passed grave sites before. It's not just a place where dead people are buried. It's actually a place of buried dreams. And many people uh, are going to the grave with buried dreams. Many people dream to do something great for God. Many people dream of their lives being impacted for Jesus. But they end up dying buried in a place with others that did nothing with their life. God reminded me when I was putting this together of a scripture in Haggai chapter 2 and verses 3. It says this, who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look now? Does it, doesn't it seem like nothing? Now, the former glory is referred to the early church. If there's a former glory, there's going to be a latter glory, which is referring to the end time church. Now, if you want to read about the former church or the former glory, the early church, you, you have to actually go back to the book of Acts, right? 
I mean, there's some incredible stories in the book of Acts. Let's just remind us. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people come to Christ. Uh, Peter and John go to the temple uh, and sees the lame man at Gate Beautiful. Uh, Silver and God I do not have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ of Na- Lazarus, rise up and walk. He stands up. For 42 years, oh my goodness, what, what an incredible, amazing moment that is. Uh, Philip being translated uh, 30 uh, miles away to another place. Paul resurrecting people from the dead. Pramides, so powerful, literally creating earthquakes. I could go on. But the scripture is saying, compare the earlier church to the church of today. Doesn't it seem like nothing? But but come on, we're going to look at this promise because you go to uh, chapter 2, verses 7. It says this, I will shake the nations and the desires of the nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord. And then he says this, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord. Donald Trump says this uh, when he travels the nunch and he says, make America great again. Well, what I say is this, make the church great again. So how do we make a difference? How do we make the church great again? We're going to give you some points. Three things. Go, so, mo. Go, so, mo. Let's have a look at the first one. Go. Now we have to do our part in going. Two thirds of God is go. And so that means it's got to start with me changing a mindset from a me mindset to a missional mindset. Now you might be asking, what do you mean by a missional mindset? Life can't be all about me and my own desires uh, or you and your own desires. That's selfish living. Uh, Let me help you create a missional mindset. I want to give you a a few statistics here. Right now, 8.1 billion people on the planet. 140 million babies are born every year. 60 million are dying. That means that currently the population is growing by 80 million people each year, and this number is only increasing. The cool thing is that 100,000 people come to Christ daily. That's 36,500,000 people per year. Of the 8.1 billion people on the planet, 3.2 billion currently are Christians. So that's 28% of the planet are Christians, leaving 78% that are worshiping something else. That 78% equates to 4.9 billion people. Now, many of these people literally have no access to the gospel. We here in America, incredibly blessed. Churches everywhere, easy access to the gospel. We, We can just pull out our phones and tap and we can find the gospel. But there are parts of the planet that are unreached, areas of the planet, people groups that have never heard about Jesus. There are 195 countries on the planet. 31 of those countries, of the 195, less than 10% are Christian. Now, the world is a very big place to reach. In fact, uh, uh, the reality is we're not going to be able to personally get to them all. And it doesn't mean I do nothing about it, but I must do something. Uh, We must do something. And as individuals in a church, we must do our part in going. Jesus said this, go into all the world and preach the good news. The second thing is so. Now, there are parts of the planet where we will never get to visit. Parts of the planet we may never go, but we must so. You heard it, go so. The gospel is free, but it costs money to distribute. I'm excited today to talk about where our missions money is going over the coming months. Now, firstly, I want to congratulate you since the church launched. As a church, we've given just over $200,000 in mission money. Incredible result for a church plan that's been going two and a half years. Now, by now, you would have received this year's Vision Builder brochure. That is the detailed plan of our missions giving over the coming season. But let me give you an overview. The next season of missions giving here at Game Changer Church, well, the first thing is soul winning. With 78% of the planet who don't know Jesus, we must do our part in spreading the gospel by sowing into large-scale crusades, evangelistic meetings, uh, missions trip, and training pastors in developing nations. The second thing is reaching the next generation. Now, there's a term in the kingdom called the 4 to 14 window. It's a term that describes the age where people are most likely to accept Jesus. Now, statistically, 85% of uh, people that make decisions for Jesus are between the ages of 4 to 14. 
So that being said, we've got to do our part selling finances to reach the next generation. So these are some of the things we want to sell into with the next generation. The first thing is a kids outreach in India. We've partnered with a church, uh, a ministry called Sozo Ministries, uh, who've got a coming kids outreach. I'm excited about sewing into that. I'll tell you more about that later. Number two, Compassion International. As a church, over the last few years, we've been uh, sponsoring a little girl in the Dominican Republic. We plan to continue looking after that girl, educating, getting the gospel into her life. Thirdly, Kids Fest. Man, we had an incredibly successful uh, VBS. Uh, 90% of those that registered came from the community. And uh, my goodness, I mean, we had uh, over 30 kids that responded, gave their life to Jesus. Incredible. And next year, we want to take that to the next level. But we've discovered we've got a great program, but we can't keep it to ourselves here in Frisco. We thought, wouldn't it be great? Let's take Kids, kids Fest to developing nations and uh, let's do it in uh, places that don't get to hear the gospel. Uh, number three, uh, there's other ministry partnerships, Feeding the Poor in downtown Dallas at Christmas time, uh, church plants, ministry partnerships. Why? Because we want to further the gospel. The brochure that you've been given is going to explain it a whole lot more in detail. Now, now that you've heard the vision of the sowing, let's get back to the word. Malachi chapter 3 and verses 7 through 10 says this. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you've asked, how do we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. You ask, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, a whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. There may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see that I not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there is not enough room to, to, to store it. Now, there's two parts to sowing that I want to talk about. Number one, the tithe. The second one is the offering. I want to make it really clear, as an individual, if you do not understand the power of tithes and offerings in your life and obedient to that, you'll never understand the fullness that God has for you financially. So let's just break it down. The tithe. The tithe is a term which means simply 10%. When one tithes, it means to give 10% of your income. Now, many say, well, I tithe, but understand it's not tithing if you're just throwing in a 20, a 50, or a 100 here and there. The, the Bible says to bring the whole tithe. So consider your income. God makes it really easy for you. Uh, and he just simply says this, take your total and uh, figure out what 10% is and bring that to the storehouse. Now, the storehouse is a term that is used for your local church. Uh, so uh, it's not to go to the political party or to this good cause or to save the panda fund. No, it's there for your local church. And so as you manage this, the promise is simply this. He says this, see that I'll open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there'll be not enough room to store it. Now, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Miles Monroe, and he's going to explain the power of the tithe. The reason why God created tithing, tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. Can I say it again? Just for the CD purpose. <laughs> tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. God doesn't need nothing from you. You couldn't even give God nothing. Everything on the earth already belongs to God. He don't need nothing from us. So when God sets something up, it's not because He needs it. Tithing and offerings is God's management training program for mankind. Boy, this is so important. God doesn't need a penny from us. And yet he tells us 10% of everything is mine. We only think of money. And that's our problem. If you get 10 pairs of shoes, one of them ain't yours. If you get 10 dresses, one of them ain't yours. 
You bought 10 oranges. One of them is not yours. If you got 24 hours in a day, 2 hours and 40 minutes don't belong to you. I ain't got no time to pray. What are you talking about? You got 2 and a half hours and 40 minutes that don't belong to you. You're a thief every day when you don't use those 2 hours and 40 minutes for God's purposes. You are a thief. A tired thief. <laughs> Sleeping on God's time. You spend two hours, four hours, eight hours watching cable television and don't give God his two hours and 40 minutes that belong to him. Ten percent. You can't even manage two hours and 40 minutes. You're trying to get money. You ain't money, money in your problem. Management is your problem. God could any time of day command you to give the dress away in your closet. One of them ain't yours. So tithing and offering is not about money. It's about management. Can you consistently, God says, Put aside 10% of everything for my purposes. That's tithing. Can you consistently? Now, now, now let, me, let me tell you something. Listen to me. 100% of everything belongs to God. What did I say? No, no. Say it again. What did I say? Everything belongs to God. Okay. So, if God blesses you with a paycheck of a thousand dollars. How much of that belongs to God? Okay, you're doing good. You're the smart. Now, how much did God say to put aside for His work? Ten percent. How many is left? Ninety percent. Which one of those belong to God? Oh, you're getting smart. Okay. All right. So then why would God, if he owns all 1,000, want you to put aside 10% if all but still belongs to him? Why? Because it's not about the money. It's about your ability to put it aside. Your will, your control, your discipline to put it aside. He's after your discipline. Wow. If you can manage the 10% properly, then he is happy to trust you with the 90% that's left. But because you've been unfaithful in the 10%, you keep losing the 90%, so you end up with no percent. That's why you're broke. And so you tell God, I can't pay ties this week, things tough. We're in crisis right now, God. You've got to figure this out. Things too rough. God is saying, what are you talking about? Your salvation is in the tide. Hmm. Let me take you one step further. This is what tithing does to you. Number one. What's the first word? Accountability. Accountability. Write it down. Now, each one of these words is management. If you keep paying your tithes and giving your offering, you automatically first become accountable. What's the second word? Discipline. Discipline. For you to put that aside every single time, it takes control. What's the third word? Honesty. Honesty. For you to be a tither, that means no one's watching except God. And he knows if you paint it or not. You can lie to everybody else, but God knows if you pay 10%. That means it makes you honest. And managers must be honest. What's the fourth word? Diligence. Diligence. Diligence means that you work at it constantly to make sure you don't steal that 10%. That's what managers are supposed to do. What's the next word? Oh my God. That's what's wrong with managers. They are unfaithful. And it takes faithfulness to tithe. What's the last one? Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. For you to manage a tithe, God got to trust you every time. 
I just gave you the characteristics of a manager. They are accountable, they are honest, they are diligent, they are faithful, they are trustworthy. Incredible teaching there. Let's just go to the second part. First part is the tithe, the second part is the offering. The offering is considered an offering once we've given the tithe. So the offering, in essence, is over and above the tithe. So, and that's what Vision Builders is all about. We're asking you to prayerfully consider sowing finances over and above the tithe to reach those missional projects that we're talking about. The tithe, what does it do? It opens up the heavens, but it's the sowing of the offering over and above. When you sow into Vision Builders, it brings you into this promise. The promise that is given to us, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. It says this, remember this. Now, if it starts out with remember this, God wants you to remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. As you generously commit to sowing into vision builders, you're going to see God generously open up the blessing over your life. So if we want to make a difference, number one, go. Number two, sow. And number three, mow. <laughs> what are you talking about? Go, sow, mow. Uh, when you take on the responsibility of owning your own home, whether you buy a house, whether you rent a house, it's my job to take on the responsibility to mow the lawns. Uh, it's about me doing my part to maintain the property. My goal is that everyone at Game Changer Church or 100% of the church are going to do their part when it comes to vision builders. And we're encouraging people. In fact, I'm challenging people at Game Changer Church to get involved. That means kids through the adults. And, and hear me clearly here. It's not about equal giving. It's actually about equal sacrifice. We're asking you to, over the coming weeks, uh, leading up to the Vision Builders Gala, to prayerfully consider what you would sow over and above your tithes until June of 2025. And as we do those three things, go, sow, and mow, we're going to make a difference, a difference that will save souls, win disciples, and build the kingdom of God. Well, I'm going to pray and uh, come on, let's uh, close our eyes across this place. Jesus, we're incredibly excited that we get the opportunity to make a difference. I ask God that you would stir our hearts to go and take the gospel to people groups. I pray God you'd stir our hearts to sow finances, to build and extend the kingdom of God. And I pray, Lord God, stir us to do our part, to mow what we've been called to be responsible with. In fact, God, I'm asking God that you'd speak to us about our part to play and vision builders, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.